really, really happy to be able to introduce Graham and Lise. Um, Lise, first of all, Lise Pinkos is a proud Franklin Manitoba, both a Bachelor's of Arts degree and a Master of Education degree, both from Université de Saint Boniface. Her studies focused on human rights education and how students can learn about human rights to become engaged in taking action. Lise was part of the inaugural team at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and is currently the manager of education programs. What an awesome job, it's so fabulous. Um, throughout her career at the museum, Lise has been privileged to have the opportunity to meet with Canadians from coast to coast to coast who generously shared their human rights stories with the museum. In her current role, she oversees the development and implementation of human rights education programs on site and online for learners of all ages. Lise is vice president of the Board of Nominations of the and his mama to Marianne, César, and Théodore, who has two years. How do you like my French, Lise? Not bad. Très bien. Okay. Graham Lowe's is passionate about creating learning experience for students that encourage critical thinking, are student-driven, and address real-world problems in authentic and tangible ways. A former classroom teacher, Graham began his work with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights as the educator in residence in 2017. He's developed a wide variety of education programs focusing on reaching students and teachers throughout digital platforms. Graham loves spending time outdoors with his young family, Oliver, Theodore, and Adeline, particularly when those adventures take them into the wilderness. He also dabbles in furniture design, has planted too many trees to count. I love that about you, Graham, and enjoys a good cup of coffee. So welcome to both of you and welcome everybody for this wonderful and exceptional opportunity for us to do a virtual tour of the Museum for, for Human Rights. Thank you, Lindy. I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I see the note about the sound lead. Part of that is actually that uh, Graham is in the museum and uh, the museum has a number of exhibits, many of them who have sound that we can't um, shut down. So um, there may be others who have their mics on, but you may be also hearing some sound lead even when the mics are on. And that, I apologize, that could be frustrating, but it's typically from our exhibits. So um, I just want to start off by acknowledging that the museum is located um, in Winnipeg on ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory. Uh, the Red River Valley, where the museum is, is also the birthplace, birthplace of the Métis Nation. And also want to acknowledge that the water in the museum uh, and in Winnipeg um, is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. Um, that's the acknowledgement that you see when you come into the museum, when you come onto our website. Um, and I just want to take a second to talk about what it means for me. Uh, my family are, uh, is settler colonial. Uh, we've uh, been in this land and on this territory for over a hundred years. And uh, I feel when I read this, I feel a sense of responsibility towards this land. I reflect on the relationship that I have um, and renew a commitment to ensuring um, that that relationship is careful, that the relationship that I have with the Indigenous peoples of this land is also cared for. And I, I reflect on it when I uh, make this statement and think about what my responsibilities are in particular in making sure that my children also think of their relationship with this land, their relationship with the Indigenous peoples of this land and ensuring that they understand the truth of the history of what happened here. So today, in the next hour or so, um, Graham and I are going to take you through the museum. Um, so first off, a little bit about our museum. We are a national museum. We are the fifth or fifth national museum to be built, the first one that was built since 1967. And we are located in Winnipeg, as we spoke about. We opened only in 2014, so we're very new. Uh, we are an ideas museum, so we don't collect a lot of artifacts. In fact, we do have a few artifacts in the museum, uh, but they are mostly borrowed. They rotate through. Uh, what we do collect, though, is stories. Uh, so uh, we started off, um, as Lindy mentioned, uh, with a big national engagement tour where we met with Canadians in every province and territory and heard uh, their human rights stories and those stories were the inspiration for um, some of what you see in the museum. Uh, we have a 
special focus on Canadian stories, but we also look uh, to the international community and all over the world to bring in stories from, from different areas of the world. Um, so today we're going to talk to you about our virtual field trips. We have uh, six different virtual field trips that we're offering right now. Uh, we were lucky that we had been working on virtual field trips, both developing and delivering them before the pandemic, which feels very good now. Um, our virtual field trips are for kindergarten all the way through grade 12. Uh, they are offered in both French and in English. Et une note pour ceux qui sont francophones, euh, je suis, ce serait mon plaisir de répondre à vos questions en français si vous en avez. Uh, we have a virtual field trip that's called Journey to Human Rights. That's a general program. And then we go into more specifics. So we have a program that's called Be an Upstander for middle years, uh, one uh, called Expressing Rights Through Art, also for middle years. And then at the high school level, we have a program called Dignity and Rights and Deliberating Charter Rights. And all through this session today, uh, Graham, who is in the galleries, will um, show you the galleries and talk to you about how we integrate those into our virtual programs. Uh, finally, a note, this is really giving you quite a good flavor about what our virtual programs are. All of our programs are live, um, so you, um, your class gets to interact with a guide. Uh, some of our programs, we have an uh, ability to have a chat function, and others, we are we can connect with your class, whether they're in a classroom, whether they're at home, whether they're hybrid learning and half of them are in the classroom and half of them are at home. We're happy to connect um, through all sorts of different ways. So it's, it's right now it's a great way to get your class um, maybe out of their sort of their classroom or their homes and into somewhere different for a, a, a different learning opportunity. Um, I will keep I will try to remember to stop sharing my screen and at that point I'll be able to see your chat. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'll make sure we have a moment to ask them. Um, and we'll also take some time at the end of the, uh, the presentation to answer any questions you may have. So with that, I will pass it over to Graham who will give you an intro into the galleries. And just to note, as we mentioned at the beginning, we, we haven't been in this museum since um, other than yesterday, since mid-October. And so if we're a bit rusty on the galleries, it's because we haven't seen them in so very long. And the museum is still very closed, but we are delivering programs. Our guides are coming in to deliver these programs right now. Thanks, Liz. Uh, yeah, I just want to echo that. I watched uh, one of our interpreters deliver a program on Thursday and I was like, ooh, I am not up to, up to snuff right now. So they're doing a really great job. Um, but I'll hopefully we'll get you a, a bit of an idea of what we've got going on in the museum. So I'm here today in our first gallery <clears throat> space called What Are Human Rights? And uh, in this gallery space, you can see behind me, uh, we have uh, uh, the article one from the UDHR uh, and it states, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. I really love that statement and sort of uh, to ground us. We always ground our students in something to start the program. And that's really what we're about here at the museum is to help students understand what that statement means uh, and then unpack it at a level that is age appropriate and appropriate for them. So um, as we move through these spaces, um, we'll, I'm just going to pick you up and I'm going to flip you around so you can see a little bit more. Uh, you don't need to see my face. My face. Uh, am I full screen? Um, Lise, am I pinned? Are pinned. Let me. Uh, it could be um, that you need to just change your view if you can't see Graham full screen yeah. and go to speaker view because he should be pinned if you're in speaker view. That's correct. You should be able to see yourself, Graham, and see exactly what is uh, being viewed by just changing your view. Go to speaker view. And yeah. Lee, you're able to see the chat box now. You have to actually click on chat at the bottom and then it opens up the chat box. Yeah. I can, I'm, I'm watching it right now. So thank you, Lindy. Awesome, Graham, you're okay now? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, it was uh, somebody in the chat who was asking the question, so. All right, so uh, here we are in uh, our first gallery. Like I said, we have the timeline here. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time uh, in this first gallery in our tour, uh, but we do, um, we do talk a little bit about that. Where we do spend time in almost every tour uh, is in this next gallery space. Um, and this next gallery space is called Indigenous Perspectives. Um, and uh, we find it's really important for us at the museum to, when we talk about human rights, to not forget to talk about uh, the human rights uh, that are going on and that really ground us uh, in where we are today. 
Um, we can't talk about genocide uh, happening around the world if we don't talk about the genocide that happened here. Uh, but we don't just talk about um, the, the human rights violations. We also talk about the, the different positive elements and, and the, the culture that, um, that Indigenous people have here. Um, in this gallery space, when we, uh, we ex examine this gallery space, uh, interpreters will talk about the three different uh, Indigenous groups uh, that we have uh, here in Canada, First Nations, uh, Métis, and Inuit. Uh, and then we also, uh, throughout our tour, uh, try to give students an opportunity to see uh, the scope and scale of some of the things that we've got going on in the museum. I'm just going to turn you around here. And on this uh, wall here, actually, I'm going to just flip you and get a little bit of a better perspective on it. So there we have um, uh, an art piece called Trace. Uh, so we, uh, with, especially with our early year students, we, we spend some time with this art piece uh, and sort of intro uh, how we uh, want to ground the museum. Then we have an idea what this might look like or what they think it looks like. You can pop that in the chat, unmute yourself and say it. So we get a lot of different answers. Some say it's a blanket, some say it looks like an octopus. Um, but what, it, what the really interesting thing about this piece is that is it is in fact um, a number of really small uh, beads. And each of these beads is actually the clay from the Red River that runs just outside the museum. The people took the, it in their hand, they squished that bead uh, together and then it was dried. And so thousands and thousands of beads of people and of the land have been brought into the museum uh, and this runs from our second floor all the way up to our fourth floor. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a scale. Um, and yeah, we get a lot of the blankets and those kind of things. And, and uh, we talk a little bit about um, interpretation and how, how, we, um, how we see things and how we view the world. Uh, and this is where we start uh, all our tours, acknowledging the land and understanding that um, Indigenous people uh, were here and that we really wanted to bring um, some of the earth and, and that land back into the museum. There's lots of other ways that we communicate that through the art, through the architecture in the building, uh, through different programs and different things that, uh, and different um, artifacts and, and exhibits. Uh, but that's just one way that we, we highlight that with our students. And thanks, Lisa, it's called Trace by Rebecca Belmore. Moving on into our next space. Um, this is uh, the Hall of Hope. And the Hall of Hope runs uh, throughout the museum uh, from the, uh, first floor all the way up to the uh, seventh floor. And you can see these ramps here uh, are how you travel through the museum. Uh, these ramps are illuminated and they're made of alabaster. Uh, the idea behind these ramps is that as you travel through our museum, uh, you'll notice that you start in places where it is fairly dark and there isn't a lot of light. And then these ramps sort of signify the journey that we're on of human rights from darkness and towards light. As we get further up into the museum, more and more natural light comes in, it becomes brighter, we talk about more hopeful things. Um, and these ramps are a way for, for us to signify that journey, that the journey of human rights is a long one. There's almost a kilometer of ramps in our building, uh, but it's also an upward battle. It's an upward journey that we have to, that we have to take and that we're, we're going on. Uh, also, it's a, a time for, as we travel through the galleries, when you're dealing with difficult content, it's a time for reflection. Uh, when we talk about education programs, when we talk about uh, teaching human rights, reflection is a really important uh, part of that, not just talking about the bad things that happen, but giving students and giving adults a uh, time and space to reflect. Uh, and these are made of alabaster, which is seen to have some healing properties in some cultures, and give it a, a time to reflect as you travel between different gallery spaces uh, throughout our museum. You'll get a better look of those as I'm going to walk about half of them today. Um, so I've got my step counter on, and so hopefully I'll hit 10,000 before I have my second coffee this morning. Uh, into our next uh, gallery space is called Canadian Journeys. In this gallery space, uh, you will ex uh, explore uh, this gallery space in the Journey to Human Rights program. Oh, and I should say that the Indigenous gallery space before uh, you see that in the Journey to Human Rights program, uh, we're developing a Indigenous rights program uh, that will be launching soon. Uh, and you can check our website. Uh, Lise will show you how to do that uh, in a little bit uh, for all that information. Uh, but you'll see that that gallery and journey for, to human rights, as well as you'll spend a lot of time in this gallery on journey to human rights, that virtual field trip. So in Canadian journeys here, we have a number of different alcoves. Each of the alcoves tells a story of Canadian human rights uh, issues and experiences. Some of these stories are positive stories. Some of these stories are negative stories, um, but they're a great way for 
uh, us to start conversations with students uh, that's connected to the curriculum, to what they're studying, what they're learning about. Um, there's lots of opportunity to explore and to connect different themes of human rights from uh, the Red Dress Project about missing and murdered Indigenous women, workers' rights uh, with the Winnipeg General Strike, uh, the right to vote, um, the uh, same-sex marriage niche when we talked about uh, when that happened. Um, we explore ideas uh, of language rights. We talk about the Indian residential school system and recognizing genocide, Chinese railway, disability rights, and a number of different other rights. And depending on uh, the age of your group, we also sometimes uh, do some, an activity around here. It doesn't really work when there's just me, but um, there's a fun thing that we do with students to, uh, to talk about how um, our rights are, um, how all our rights are interconnected and how we connect. I'm gonna start heading up the ramps and uh, I will let Lee's take over for a little bit and then uh, I'll be back in the next gallery. So I am back. Um, I think one of the great things about our virtual field trips um, is that, you know, what we're doing today is we're really just showing you, we want to show you as many spaces as possible. But if you're uh, on a virtual field trip with your class, we try to keep to two or three different spaces in the museum and uh, give an opportunity for students to ask questions of the interpreter, but also to discuss or to do an activity with each other. Uh, for instance, in the Expressing Rights Through Art program, students are encouraged to draw and um, reflect on what they're learning through expressing their own art throughout the program. So it's not just this sort of passive um, uh, watching of a tour of the museum, but really an opportunity to, to try and get as much of what you would get if you were coming to the museum um, in your classroom. One question that we always get, so we try to cover it, is what platforms we use. So we started off using Skype, if you can remember what that was, uh, but we now use um, Zoom, Teams, and Google Classroom. And really what we're trying to do is meet you wherever you are teaching your students. We know that there are different requirements and different restrictions based on your school board or your school division. Um, so we, we work with you to make sure that it works for you. Uh, so whether that is that you send us a link because um, that's what you need for the privacy or where we send you a Zoom link, um, our booking folks are happy to work with you to make sure that we can, we can get into your classroom. Uh, maybe just a note about how to book the program. So at the end, we'll, we'll share our website or humanrights.ca. Um, I'm hoping that you can see the website now on the screen. Um, but once you hit the website, if you go to the education tab under book your school, it's, it's quite easy to book. So there's two buttons here. Uh, you would go to the virtual program button. You'll see there that the, uh, the program is typically $125, uh, but we have now a grant from the Richardson Foundation and we'll soon be adding a grant from the Asper Foundation in order to be able to provide virtual uh, field trips for free. Um, so um, that means that if you are looking to book all the grade fives in your school, you can actually book them all individually. You don't have to worry about the cost. Um, the programs are better for students if they're just, you know, 20, 25 students in a program. Um, it gives you that opportunity for, for more interaction and, and easier learning. So the form is online here. All you have to do is fill out the form and then you'll be in contact with uh, one of the great folks in our booking team, either Carrie or Janelle, who will connect with you and who will work with you on timing, et cetera. Uh, all of our programs are 30 minutes to an hour. So the younger you are, the shorter there you are. They don't go over an hour, but we're certainly also able to work with you um, depending on what your class block is um, to be able to make sure that we're fitting within that class block. So really flexible in, in meeting teachers' needs across the country. I will stop sharing my screen now. I see there's some stuff in the chat and I will turn it back over to Graham. Yeah, Go so I'm here, I'm here in the, uh, in our, on our third level in uh, protecting rights in Canada. Uh, and in this gallery space, uh, typically in the pre-COVID times, we would gather students around here. Uh, they would use touch screens and have some great debate and dialogue 
all things that we can't really do because they're not six feet apart and we can't touch things in the museum. Um, but one of the great things about this program uh, that with students is they would uh, examine char Canadian charter cases. Uh, we present them with some information and then they would have to vote and debate about um, a charter case before they would hear how the Supreme Court of Canada um, landed on that case. We've now taken this program and uh, we've moved it online so that we can do it with your students uh, in a classroom. Uh, so we've got some of our video content for using the poll function and the chat function in Zoom. Um, we found that it's been fairly engaging for students, uh, especially in a remote learning environment, because you can all gather together, uh, discuss around something. Um, and uh, with this program, uh, I, I know I've seen some questions about group size in the chat uh, popping up. This program is something that, because it's so uh, discussion-based, we're finding that the smaller the group, the better. Uh, with some of our programs, um, group size, it depends on how you're presenting. Uh, when you're presenting to a lot of uh, people, if they're remote, uh, the smaller the size, the better. If you're presenting to a class, you can maybe do two classes at once, um, but uh, we can go up to 100, uh, but we wanna have, um, it's, we find that our, our program is better and our interpreters are better able to interact with your students um, if we can, uh, if it's a bit of a smaller group. So from here, I'm gonna go into our next space. Um, and this is called the Garden of Contemplation. Uh, this is sort of uh, the hub and the atrium of our museum. As you can see, as I move up again, there's more natural light coming in uh, to the museum. Around uh, the Garden of Contemplation, we have the salt. Um, this the salt rock was chosen uh, specifically because it's found around the world, and we wanted people to have a connection to uh, a global uh, idea. They're interconnected, they're interlocking, there's lots of um, messaging that we can talk about there. And then you get to be, you begin to see sort of the scale of the museum as well as what we call the cloud. Um, when you are, are here, you begin to see um, there's lots of interpretation around what the museum looks like, how the architecture represents human rights, how it's connected to land and those sorts of things. Um, I know your computer screens don't really quite do it justice, but you have to come here. We'd love to have you here at some point, um, but that's kind of, the idea of here. You can see from here uh, all the way up to the top of the museum, um, how I was talking about at the way at the top, we'll get there at the end is the Tower of Hope, um, where we talk about uh, how that journey ends and how it's unfinished. Um, and that we'll get to there in a little bit. So uh, that goosebumps over Zoom, that's a good thing. So I'm gonna do, I got a little bit of a longer walk coming up and uh, Lisa is going to share a little bit about uh, some of the resources that we offer online as well. Sorry. There we go. Um, so one of the, I think, the benefits of a virtual field trip is um, the fact that students are in their comfort zone. One of the things that we're finding is that students are actually asking um, more interesting questions. Uh, they're engaging in a different way um, and than they do when they're in the museum. And we wonder if that's because they're in their classrooms, they feel a little bit safer, they're at their homes and they feel safer to interact with us. Um, I think the other sort of um, benefit is that you're able to, if you'd like, um, scaffold the learning or, or bring um, resources and extend the learning in the classroom. So we do have some resources for, for that for you if that's something you're interested in. Um, the first resource I'll speak to is our web stories. So um, at the bottom um, picture here, you can see the childhood denied uh, stories. So we have a collection of about uh, 40 and growing uh, web stories. These stories are written by our curators or uh, other staff at the museum. We also sometimes have guest writers um, and they are content that we have in our galleries, sometimes uh, augmented. Um, that we bring in videos that we have in our galleries, we bring in photographs that we have in our galleries, and they tell a wide variety of different stories and on topics that we explore in the museum. Uh, they're great for whether you want to preview something that you're going to talk about, that you're going to see in the virtual field trip, if you want to send your students there to do um, some of their own research, uh, it gives you a great um, overview and recap of a number of different stories. This one that we have featured here, Childhood Denied, is on uh, residential schools. Um, it has at, um, embedded in an 11 minute video that is shown in our gallery that's quite uh, powerful and quite moving. I suggest that um, you have you head over there after our, our 
field trip to have a look at it um, and also get the sort of the breadth of our stories. Right now, this month, we're featuring uh, stories on um, Black History Month, um, and we're always adding those stories, adding to those stories. So uh, it's certainly a, a great resource for you. Um, we also have a toolkit, um, so that can be found under the education tab of the uh, website. And in the toolkit, we have brought together resources that exist on our website, but also great human rights resources that we've encountered. We work with our librarian here at the museum, who is also was also in the past life a teacher librarian. Um, we worked with uh, educators across the country to bring in great human rights resources that support our programs and that support human rights education in the classroom. Uh, one of the tools and features that uh, we are working on in this area, and we'd love to have your input if you are passionate about human rights education, you do a lot of this work in the classroom, you've got something that works for you, a system that works for you, you can connect with us and we're happy to share that system so that other teachers can see it. So we'll put the, the resources that you use to discuss a particular human rights topic or issue or theme and uh, share a bit about how, how you use them and other teachers can then have a look at that and see, see what works for them. So this is another area that we are often adding to uh, and a place to check back. And then finally, uh, we had the opportunity or Graham had the opportunity to work with the Montreal Holocaust Museum a couple of years ago to develop the Us Versus Them resource. Uh, this is a teaching guide that looks at the Holocaust and the Rohingya genocide and uh, shows how, how othering can contribute or can lead to uh, genocide. Uh, it is an excellent resource. Um, it has lesson plans in it. Um, it has a lot of information in it. Um, it it's, and it's a great resource that would link to a program that Graham is about to speak to you now, um, a Dignity and Rights virtual field trip. So um, certainly if you are teaching at a high school level and you're examining uh, some of those difficult topics, uh, we are absolutely ready to help um, both with some resources, but also with um, a virtual field trip. So with that, I'll swing back to Graham. Go ahead, Graham. All right. So we are here in the examining Holocaust gallery space. Uh, this space is broken into three different uh, parts, abuse of state power on the back wall, you can't really see over there, uh, persecution, and then on the far side, which we'll get to uh, genocide. Um, like Lee said, we spend time in this space on the uh, dignity and rights uh, virtual field trip. Uh, during that virtual field trip, we touch on three different genocides uh, in about an hour, um, but an hour isn't really time to really dive into um, specifics on the genocide, but what we do look at is we look at the idea of othering. The idea of othering is the idea that we can, uh, that we categorize a, a group of people uh, or we impose a, a category or categorize a group of people. Uh, and then uh, the second part of that is seeing that group as less than, um, less than human. Um, and so we see that uh, throughout uh, genocides and mass atrocities, whether it's the residential school system, the Holocaust, Rwanda, um, all these different uh, genocides and mass atrocities, there is that element of othering. And that's the idea that we explore in 45 minutes because we can't really, uh, we tried and we can't really get into it uh, and we can't do them justice in 45 minutes. Normally we take students when they come here, they spend two hours with us uh, to look at that. And so uh, we can't do that in that format. So I'm gonna, I'm not gonna spend a, a ton of time examining some of these things, but um, you just kind of get an idea. Um, when we come into these spaces, we give students uh, examples of how othering manifests itself, what it looks like. Um, we talk about othering because uh, when you understand some of the root causes um, of genocide and of mass atrocities and human rights violations in general, um, then you can see the patterns that are evolving and othering is one of those foundational patterns that evolves in all human rights violations. Um, one of the ways that we talk about this is this book here. I'm not sure if you've seen it before. Um, it is called The Poisonous Mushroom. This is a book, it was a school book um, in the, uh, that teachers were teaching in Germany. Uh, this uh, book is full of caricatures and pictures of uh, Jewish people. Uh, and there's a story for children in there about how uh, a mother warns her son not to go into the forest uh, because he might pick a poisonous mushroom and that poisonous mushroom will kill him. And you can see uh, on that, that book cover, 
um, sort of the large nose and, and these features uh, that were caricatures of Jewish people in that time and, and really created the idea of this was an other group of people. Uh, the mother says, says that and throughout that book, the moral of the story is avoid the Jewish people because they are the poisonous mushroom. Um, and so these are the kind of things uh, that we talk about and talk about othering to illustrate othering um, in the Holocaust and, and different ways. And that's one of the, the things uh, that, that students will get to explore when they're here among others. Just gonna give you a little bit more of a gallery preview now. Uh, in the middle of our, um, our gallery, we have a theater. We call this a theater of broken glass uh, for Kristallnacht. Um, and, uh, and inside that we actually, uh, we have students uh, watch a video called anti-Semitism in Canada, talking about how um, anti-Semitism wasn't limited to, uh, to Nazi Germany, uh, but it was in Canada uh, during the interwar period and even during the, the Second World War. Um, like I said, we, we have uh, this uh, third, the second and third wall here. Um, we talk about persecution and the different groups uh, that were persecuted uh, during the Holocaust. And finally, how that othering leads towards um, is the groundwork for, for genocide. One more uh, thing that we also have here, uh, we have a, a large scale map of uh, Auschwitz. Um, but when we do talk about this, uh, one of the things that I, I was, um, the curator of this exhibit showed me was this picture here. And uh, it's an interesting picture because, uh, especially when we talk about othering, because we can see that uh, this group of individuals, uh, they're having a good time. They clearly have the, the uh, compassion for each other. They can experience joy. Uh, yet they all worked in Auschwitz, but they're on a break um, and they can treat each other as human, but when uh, othering manifests itself and is fully formed um, leading towards the mass atrocity, um, they're seeing another group as less than human. And so within all of us, there is the capacity to care for other humans, but when we can dehumanize and when we, we other, that's when we, we can start to run into problems with human rights violations. And those are the kind of things um, that, we, that we talk about uh, on this Dignity and Rights Program. I'm gonna leave you with one of my favorite quotes from the gallery before we move on to the next space. Um, it's from Elie Wiesel and it says this, uh, there may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be times when we fail to protest. And that's where we end the Dignity and Rights Program. Uh, we, we talk about Romeo Dallaire and the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda um, and how um, in all our, pro whenever we see those injustices, understanding, uh, that we can protest even if we feel like we don't have um, anything, if we can't make a, a, a huge difference on them. Um, that's what we must do. Uh, in this gallery space here, uh, this is called Turning Points for Humanity. Um, we will usually come in here, we'll talk about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the Four Freedoms, uh, those types of things. Uh, a lot of what's in this gallery is great interactive when you are um, in person. Uh, so it does, we don't spend a lot of time here on our virtual field trips, but if you want to bring students or you come yourself, uh, then you can, you, can, uh, you can definitely see some of that. And then finally, uh, we have this area here. This table here is normally lit up in the before times. Uh, it's a touchscreen table. It examines um, mass atrocities from the transatlantic slave trade right through to North Korea and uh, beyond. We're constantly updating it, uh, and it allows students when they're in person to examine um, what those human, what mass atrocities look like and break it down. Uh, that's where we spend about an hour of our, uh, our on-site program that deals with genocide, uh, but we can't uh, do that in the museum. I'm gonna move to the next space. Is there any questions or comments? Graham, what's the, what's the statue of the little girl? Oh, yeah, sorry, let me just... Uh, this is the... Um, Statue of Bitter Memories, like, like I said, I'm a little bit rusty, uh, but this is for the Holodomor. Um, and this is, um, yeah, so uh, you can see here, she's got five sheaves of wheat, uh, Bitter Memories of Childhood. Uh, and five sheaves of wheat was the, uh, the maximum amount of uh, wheat that they were allowed to have uh, without being persecuted uh, by, oh, it's getting, it's fuzzy. Um, in Ukraine, I believe, um, and uh, and so this is a, uh, that mem that statue there. So, sorry if you ask one of our interpreters, I'm sure they could tell you 
uh, in much more detail. But uh, like I said, I'm a little bit rusty on my delivery. You did great. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I was just No, kidding. it's fine. That's, that's the way it is. Uh, we do actually have boxes of tissues uh, around the museum when people are here. Um, and that's part of the reason, like I'm going through this in 45 minutes, but we find that most of our visitors, uh, they'll take, they plan for two hours and they get through uh, usually the first and um, like the first two floors, they get up to here, they examine the Holocaust. And, and after that point, they, uh, they find that they don't have enough time to get through the rest of it. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why we have benches throughout. We've got spaces where, uh, and terraces where people can take breaks um, from, uh, from the content because it is, it is difficult and it is quite heavy. Uh, and I think some people are sometimes unaware. Ali, did you want to talk about uh, being upstander or do you want me to just launch right into it? No, I can give you a break there, Graham. And maybe just um, just a few notes about you know how we operate. Um, one thing about our virtual field trips and any of our programs uh, in the museum, we make a big effort to be accessible as accessible as possible, and we're one of the more most accessible cultural institutions in Canada. Uh, so a note that if you have students that have uh, different requirements, uh, certainly we can, with enough lead time, we can ensure that we have ASL interpretation if that's something that your students need. Um, our, our guides are well versed in making sure that they describe things and themselves. And in fact, I, it was a miss and speaks to the fact that it's been a while that we've done this together, Graham and I, that we didn't describe ourselves and what we looked like when we first started this program. Uh, but we can absolutely work with you um, and your students on their, their particular needs that they might have. And that's another thing that we, um, if you ever get to, I like that Graham keeps talking about when you come visit the museum or hopefully you have a chance to visit the museum, it makes me think that I may get on an airplane again one day and may come out to see you next year. That would be wonderful. Uh, but certainly when, if you ever get a chance to visit the museum, you'll find that uh, one of the reasons we have ramps is so that everybody can experience uh, the museum in the same way uh, if, they, if they want to. Uh, but the other thing is that on the ramps, there isn't any information. And so a lot of museums or a lot of places would wonder why we have so much dead space. And part of the reason is that we don't, uh, if, if a person is taking an elevator through the museum, we don't want them to miss any content by not being able to take the ramps. And so we, we have a particular attention to, to that aspect of uh, the visitor experience, including as much as possible the way we do things uh, digitally and online. Um, moving to um, another resource that we have, and this one we, we take our time to talk about it separately because we're particularly proud of this resource. Uh, this is something that Graham developed uh, with the help of middle school educators here in Manitoba. Uh, this is both an interactive resource for students, but there's also a teacher guide available. Um, it's in English and Francais, as with everything we do. And uh, the resource itself walks students through this idea of what it is to be an upstander for human rights. What we find is that when students are hear about human rights, uh, they hear about either violations or they hear about um, the work that others have done, uh, they want to do something themselves and we want to make sure that we're giving them the tools that if they want to take on um, being an upstander that they can. I won't steal too much of Graham's thunder in talking about what an upstander is or how we think of what an upstander is, but I think one of the things that's important to mention is that we're not talking about um, being the next Malala. Uh, we're talking about um, students taking small steps uh, to maybe improve the lives of others in their own communities. Uh, the teacher guide that accompanies this resource allows you to turn uh, what could be a half hour or an hour exploration of a website into a two, three, four week uh, project based learning unit uh, where students can actually uh, apply some of the things they learned about being an upstander and uh, actually tackle a problem that they see in their schools or their homes or their communities. Uh, we also have a sort of a shorter version of this if you're teaching um, students that are mostly at home. We quickly sort of flipped it last spring. Uh, we, and uh, if you go onto our website under the COVID-19 Learn at Home page, you'll find sort of an abbreviated version uh, for students who are working at home. It's actually an ideal project. We saw a lot of students doing it when they were at home to be able to sort of think about something that really interested them 
and be able to access learning on human rights on, through something that really interested them. Graham is in a gallery that we um, go into when we talk about or when we deliver a virtual field trip that has the same name as Be an Upstander. So you can really take this and, and bring the museum into your classroom for a month if you wanted to um, through a virtual field trip, through this resource, and then through exploring uh, different projects. And we're also here to, to help support any of the work that you do on, on this in this area in your classroom. So I'll let Graham show you around and show you what your students might see. Yeah, thanks, Lise. So uh, the idea behind uh, the Be an Upstander project really came from uh, a mistake that I was making when I was teaching. Um, oh, sorry, I thought I flipped you, but I didn't. So you don't see anything. Give me a second here. So the idea behind Be an Upstander, like I was saying, came from a, a mistake that I made when I was teaching. We always learn best from our mistakes. And um, I had, uh, was teaching a grade seven class and a part of the curriculum here in grade seven is talking about human rights. Uh, I had built, crafted what I thought was a beautiful inquiry unit where students chose a human rights violation and, and they wrote about it. They told me about the root causes and those kind of things. And, and, uh, and we were kind of reflecting at the end of this, uh, this, this project and one of the students said, Mr. Lowe's, the world sucks. And I'm like, yeah, you know, you're right. The world does suck, um, but it's spring break and uh, we got to get into a science unit when we get back. So we can't really unpack that. Um, and so it really what ended up doing is I looked at what we were doing and what was missing was there wasn't a hopeful piece at the end that we were looking at human rights violations. We were looking at different ways of life around the world um, and we were seeing the inequities and we were seeing the problems, but the students felt like they didn't have uh, power to do something. And that's what the Be an Upstander program is about. It's about empowering students, helping them understand what an upstander is. We say that an upstander is a person who one, recognizes an injustice, two, uses, knows and uses their personal strengths, and then they use those strengths to create change. We feature people like Travis Price with the Pink Shirt Day and talk about how he saw an injustice in seeing a student who was bullied. He said, hey, I can organize my friends and we can do something that creates change. Um, and we, I love the Travis Price story because it's something small. He put on a pink shirt one day and he said, you know what, me and my buddies are gonna wear a pink shirt. Uh, this kid's gonna be, feel better about himself after watching him being bullied. Um, it wasn't something big. He didn't plan for it to become a national thing. He just said, I see an injustice and I know that I have some strengths that I can organize some people and then I can create some change and make a tangible difference for that one person. Um, and that's what, what we want to do with the Be an Upstander program is help students understand that they're on that journey, that they can be upstanders by looking at some famous upstanders like uh, Travis Price, like Malali Sestai, like Viola Desmond, uh, but also recognizing that they have those traits and those characteristics within themselves to be upstanders. When we're talking about human rights, uh, it's important for kids to know and understand those uh, um, what's going on, the root causes, those things, those types of things. It's also important for them to have time to reflect um, and on that personally, how do they connect to that? But it's really important for them also to feel like it's not hopeless. We don't want students to feel like they're overwhelmed and that they're hopeless and that this, this human rights journey that we're all on is, uh, is a hopeless one. And so that's the idea behind the Be an Upstander program. We have it uh, right now, we've got it tailored for, uh, for a middle years audience because um, that's what I was brought on to do. We're looking to expand that to a high school audience right now. If you're interested in working with, with us on that, just please let us know um, and uh, we, can, uh, we can chat about how you could be involved. Um, that's it for this gallery space. I think I'm going to, uh, what time are we at here? I think I'm gonna head up to the tower now and I'll, we'll go in the glass elevator, um, like from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And, uh, and we can take some questions now if you have questions. I have a question for you. Um, I'm interested to know if you what uh, grades you teach if you're a classroom teacher or what you might be responsible for if you're responsible for a high school. I'd love to see in the chat. We'd love to get an idea of, of who's interested in our virtual field trips. So if you. And some of our participants are actually um, university professors at faculties of education. Mm, great. We, um, today we're doing, you know, this virtual field trip presentation, but we also can talk and get into some um, 
human rights topics. So we do, um, for those of you who are teacher candidates or faculty of education, we're happy to talk about how we teach human rights and some of the pedagogy behind the work that we do. If ever that is something that interests you, don't, don't hesitate to get in touch with us and we're happy to do that. We've, we, we used to do that with our faculties of education here in Manitoba. They would come into the museum for a half day and sort of get an idea of what, uh, what, how to, to tackle those topics in school. I liked seeing that, that you might bring your family when you're allowed to travel again. So K to 12, so we've got really from, from all over the place. That's great. You can watch Graham's journey as he goes up. I'm not gonna repin my self until he gets to the top because it can be quite dizzying. Right now you have to isolate for two weeks when you come to Manitoba. So you might want to wait a little bit before you get here. Also, we're closed. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for us about the museum, about our programs? Yeah, when, when uh, are you updating with the current genocide as well? I know you have Rwanda, but what about what's happening now? Will you be adding always to the museum? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, we actually have a temporary exhibit right now uh, that are that's a photography exhibit on the Rohingya genocide. Uh, so we are we try to we try to be as current as possible. It is difficult uh, because when you're developing a museum exhibit, uh, you know it's it's helpful when you can find uh, scholarly reviews uh, when you can you know when there's information available. Uh, so. We try as much as possible to work with community members, uh, to work with uh, scholars and experts in the field to develop our exhibits and to, to make sure that they are as current as possible. Uh, but another thing is our guides and our staff in the museum are very well versed in the stories that are in the museum, but also in human rights in general. And so um, when we were in the Canadian Journeys Gallery, for instance, we, there were a lot of stories about the history of Canada. Well, when you're talking about Viola Desmond, for instance, um, and racism, we can make those links um, in person to uh, racism that exists in the world right now. We can talk about Black Lives Matter. And so oftentimes our guides are sort of making that bridge. Um, and then in the stories that you see on the website that we talked about earlier, that's a place where we also try to, to bring in some more current um, stories, things that are happening in the world, react a bit to what's happening in the world, give people an opportunity on our social media platforms to also discuss uh, things that are going on in the world right now, because we know that people are very interested in them. Thank you. Derrière. Oh, mon plaisir. <laughs> So I'm here in the, oh, I can just talk about the tower and then we can, yeah. so this is the tower, uh, you can see, we get a good view of downtown Winnipeg. Uh, it's very cold here today. Uh, I think it's minus 29 without the wind chill. Um, so if you come, I recommend the winter. Um, it's uh, something like you've never felt before. And uh, uh, we are at a, um, here are the, the Forks, uh, which has been a meeting place uh, for people for over 6,000 years. Um, I didn't show it to you today, but there's a footprint they found in the museum from 6,000 years ago uh, when they uh, uh, when they were excavating the museum, uh, and this has been a meeting place of two rivers. Um, here uh, we have uh, the Red River there, and uh, and we come up to the tower, and you'll notice that this place is filled with light. Uh, this is the end of our journey for our human rights uh, field trips, and we talk about and the end of the journey for the museum. Uh, when you look at the museum from the outside, you'll notice that this tower is not doesn't look complete. It looks unfinished and that is very intentional uh, as we want people to understand that the journey of human rights isn't finished. Um, it is uh, is something that's ongoing and uh, it's something that uh, that we must uh, continue to do. And so that's kind of where we end our, our field trips uh, and where we end a lot of our programs uh, with a place of, uh, of hope uh, and a place full of light and talking about uh, the work that must continue. Go ahead, oh, Stephanie, is that a hand up or a clapping? I think it could be a clapping. So we're, we're here to answer any, thank you. 
any of your questions um, before we before we end and leave you to your lunch. It's not quite lunchtime here, but I know that you're probably getting tired of sitting and watching and uh, looking forward to taking a break, but we are, we're available for questions. We have some time for some more questions if you have them. Lisa, is there a section on uh, apartheid? So yes, and in fact, we had a great uh, traveling exhibit that actually visited you in Ontario, in Toronto, um, and then uh, London, I believe. Um, on Nelson Mandela and on apartheid in South Africa. So you'll find more of those resources online because we had that sort of temporary exhibit. Um, but you, certainly we, um, we talk about Nelson Mandela in the museum and we talk about sort of his journey. So yeah, those we cover those topics. Awesome, thank you. Other questions, folks? I saw there was a question about how long in advance do you think people have to oh, I missed that. So um, for a regular program where there's sort of no special requirements and we're just booking for your class, uh, we can book, you know, within the week. Uh, we are filling up quite a bit, however, so I would suggest getting in touch with us sooner rather than later if you're looking to book a program. A program. Um, we've, we've had a, a huge increase in demand most recently. Um, and so I would imagine that our programs are probably booked full, solid for at least a couple of weeks out, uh, but give us a, give us a call. Um, and it's, it's a good sort of rule of thumb to give us at least a week uh, before you wanna have your program. That's great. Other questions, folks? I don't wanna, I don't wanna let them go or let the rest of you go. I know we, we have a lunch break now, lunch is on your own. So you heard people in the earlier session saying, where do we go to get our lunch? So you know where to go for your lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, but any other questions for Graham and Lise who have been so generous with their time? This would be the moment. Oh, there's a question. Can you book a trip later in the school year? So yes, uh, you can book now for a trip all the way until the end of June. And uh, we do, when we're open, we are very busy in May and June. So if that is something that you're planning on doing, I don't know if that will mimic uh, what it is, you know, virtual versus open, but certainly um, plan ahead if you're planning for them. Uh, for this summer, um, there's a question about what are the hours of operation for the summer? So uh, hopefully we'll be open in the summer. Um, we right now, because of the pandemic, we're open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 5 p.m when we are open. Do the virtual tours include any follow-up activities or questions? So typically they do not um, after the class, but certainly if you have questions about that, we are happy to point you towards resources that could be helpful for any follow-up activities or questions. So you could contact either Graham or I, and we could, we could help you with that in your classroom. I think one of the things uh, too about the web stories, is uh, they have uh, at the bottom of all the web stories usually have some discussion questions or some, think some critical thinking questions. And so there'll be content that you'll see that you'll also find content that will mimic that uh, online. So you can, uh, like the Viola Desmond, if you talk about her on the virtual field trip, there's also a film and a, a web story that you can use as well as some questions that you can explore with your students as a starting point. Okay, awesome. Well, I have to say a couple of things. Um, you know, sometimes when you really want to do something, you think that when you get to that thing, you might be disappointed or it might not be as great as you thought it was going to be. And I have to say that this tour, this virtual tour did not disappoint at all. I'm even more interested in coming out and being physically there when things get back to uh, normal. Um, so I wanted to thank you both really for taking the time. You've been so gracious from the first time that we reached out to you to see if you would do this for us. You were awesome and willing. It's earlier in uh, where you are than it is here by an hour. So you woke up super early. You left your families in order to do this with us. And I wanted to say too that I think um, two things that really stood out for me. One is that Everything in your, your museum is really done from the point of view of educating others. And it looks like you've really relied on very sound pedagogy and principles of how you bring people to a better understanding. So I think the fact that you have so much that says things like 
by teachers for teachers, the fact that Graham has this background as a teacher himself, and that it's so steeped in how you really educate in a, in a sound way is so impressive. The other thing that really touched me is this notion of as you get higher up, you get to the light. And I think um, those stories of sometimes when you see the images of oppression and when you were brought to think about um, human rights, sometimes it does feel very discouraging. And this notion of, you know, it's hard work, but as we get further along with the work, we get closer to the light. And I wanted to thank you for that message as well as to the museum for being created in a way that allows that kind of thinking. So thank you so very much. Um, I'm going to now stop recording so that I can just give some information about